History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 122nd episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And on today's episode, we have a very haunted location for you. At least if you believe the hundreds of people who have declared having experiences and seeing ghostly figures at the Whaley House. So we're going to San Diego, Denise. I love San Diego, so I don't mind going there virtually, and someday let's go on a road trip. Woohoo! This location was suggested by a couple of our listeners, Michelle DePriest and Candace Nelson, and we had research assistants from April Rogers Crick. Denise, this place has a lot of different ghosts in it, but there doesn't seem to be anything bad here. So these are all... I wouldn't say necessarily good ghosts, but I think we have a lot of residual stuff going on and nothing that seems to be negative. So that's kind of nice. If you're going to have a very haunted location, it's nice not to have something evil or bad there. Exactly. So we're looking forward to bringing you the history and hauntings of that. Before we do that, we'd love to have you check out our website, historygoesbump.com. Denise, if people would like to send us some feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And on our website, we did get a couple of comments. The first one is from Kimberly. She says she loves the show and thinks that we should stop reading the stupid bad reviews on air, Denise. (laughs) She goes on to say, it's a waste of your valuable time. I'd rather hear more stories or more about your awesomeness. (laughs) Yes, we we mainly read the bad reviews because we don't want to look like we're going one-sided and only reading good things. So we just equally read all reviews that we get. So, But I do appreciate that. We really... We really do appreciate the comment. I've been enjoying making fun of some of the recent ones that we've been getting. They're just (laughs) kind of asinine. So, And we also heard from Jen. She said, hey, guys, I wanted to let you know I love your podcast. I have two sons, one being five months old, so I don't get much time to sit down and enjoy myself. So I look forward to coming to work to listen to you guys. Look at that, Denise. We make people actually enjoy going to work so that they can listen to the podcast. <laughs> That's pretty cool. We should start getting a stipend from some of these bosses. I, I think. know. Maybe we need to get them saying, hey, join our Patreon campaign. We'll keep your employees happy. <laughs> You're doing a great job, and I love all the history that goes with the ghost stories. The podcast about ghosts in the Bible was my favorite. You guys did a great job on that one. Thanks again for the hard work that goes into giving your audience a great, fun, and informational podcast. And I told Jen Denise that Ghosts in the Bible was one of our favorites as well. It was very fun to research and kind of debunk some of the common beliefs. Shell Tech had also sent us a message. I am new to podcast listening and found your podcast on an app I downloaded. I love it. I'm a retired ghost hunter and have a love for all things paranormal. I love your podcast so far. I'm currently listening to the Halloween 2014 episode. I started at number one, and I'm working my way forward, and I just love it. Thank you for an informative and well-rounded podcast. She's also got lots of stories, funny, scary, and some of them traumatizing. And then we also got an email from Katie Flanay. Hi, ladies. I just recently started listening to your show, and I love it. You ladies are so much fun to listen to. For the past two weeks, I have been binge listening to your show at work. It keeps me entertained during what can be a rather boring work day. So there's another one of those employers, Diane. (laughs) And once episode ends, I want to see what you've got in store for the next. In the future, I think it would be awesome if you ladies did a show that focused on somewhere in Minnesota. Thanks for producing such a wonderfully entertaining show. Keep up the good work. I don't know if you saw the picture that Shelby put up in the Spooktacular crew earlier today, Denise, featuring the Plainfield restaurant in New Hampshire. I did see that. Apparently, Shelby's mom is the owner of that pub. And she told us it is quite haunted. So if you guys are in New Hampshire, it's only open on the weekends. But Plainfield restaurant sounds like a cool place to check out. Denise, we have our T-shirt winner for the month of April. It's Jessica Vasquez Cask. Excellent. Congratulations, Jessica. Yeah, so congratulations to you. If you guys would like to be entered into this next month's drawing, which will be for May, all you have to do is either sign up for our newsletter, become a member of the Spooktacular crew, become an executive producer, or send us an email with your name, and uh, we'll put you in the drawing. 
And one lucky winner every single month wins an exclusively designed t-shirt. Rhonda was our designer for this t-shirt for this year. We want to welcome to the Spooktacular crew, Mitch. Hey, Mitch. Alana. Hey, Alana. Shannon. Hi, Shannon. David. Hey, David. Scott. Hi, Scott. And James. Hey, James. All right, Denise, let's go to another place that's quite sunny, San Diego. Perfect. Become an executive producer of the History Goes Bump podcast for as little as a buck a month. For $5 a month, you can access exclusive content like the Haunted True Crime bonus cast. And for $10 and above a month, you get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump for more information. Or you can give us a one-time donation by clicking the donate button at historygoesbump.com. History is full of oddities, curiosities, mysteries, and the truly bizarre. Welcome to This Moment in Oddity. The largest ship graveyard in the Northern Hemisphere is found at Malos Bay. Malos Bay is the Maryland side of the Potomac River. Today, this recreational park offers outdoor enthusiasts a wonderful habitat to observe a unique ecosystem that developed from this ghost fleet of ships. A fleet of wooden steamships was built during World War I by the United States Shipping Board Merchant Fleet Corporation. By the end of the war, these steamships were obsolete. Americans called the project the Grandest White Elephant. The ships were burned and stored in the James River. Western Marine and Salvage Company bought the ships and moved them to the Potomac River, and shortly thereafter, in 1925, the ships were towed to Mallows Bay. During World War II, the steel from the ships was salvaged. The salvage company could not decide what to do with the ships, and the company went bankrupt. Nature made the final decision as the hulls enriched the sediment and were overgrown with a new ecosystem that now makes the ship graveyard appear to be a bunch of oval-shaped islands from the air. The idea that this large ship graveyard has now become a group of islands certainly is odd. You're not afraid of a little ghost, are you? This Day in History This Day in History is by April Rogers Crick. On this day, May 4th, in 1851, a fire believed to be arson broke out in a paint and upholstery store above a hotel on the south side of Portsmouth Square in San Francisco. High winds fueled the fire and helped carry it down Kearney Street. The wind shifted to the south into the downtown area where the elevated wood plank sidewalks provided extra fuel. The fire was visible for miles out to sea and continued to burn for around 10 hours. It eventually extended to at least 18 blocks of the main business district, an area three-quarters of a mile long by a third of a mile wide. Before the fire was under control, it burned down around 2,000 buildings, which was by some estimates three-quarters of the city of San Francisco. There were at least nine lives lost in the fire, some of them in new so-called fireproof iron buildings, whose doors and shutters expanded with the heat, trapping people inside. Among the properties destroyed that day were the Niantic whaling vessel, which had been run aground to serve as a store and was subsequently rebuilt as a hotel, a general store founded by Domenico Girardelli, who would go on to found the Girardelli Chocolate Company, and all half dozen of the city's newspapers except for Alta Californian. This fire is considered the sixth and worst of a series of major fires that burned parts of San Francisco from 1849 to 1851. In terms of property values, it did twice the damage of all those earlier fires combined. Arthur Frank Marriott provides a vivid description of the fire in his memoir, Mole Hills and Mountains. Quote, The wind was unusually high, and the flames spread in a broad sheet over the town. All efforts to arrest them were useless. Houses were blown up and torn down in attempts to cut off communication. But the engines were driven back step by step, while some brave firemen fell victims to their determined opposition. As the wind increased to a gale, the fire became beyond control. The brick buildings on Montgomery crumbled before it, and before it was arrested, over a thousand houses, many of which were filled with merchandise, were left in ashes. Many lives were lost, and the amount of property destroyed was estimated at two and a half million pounds sterling. 
No conception can be formed of the grandeur of the scene, for at one time the burning district was covered by one vast sheet of flame that extended half a mile in length. You're listening to History Goes Bump. When it comes to San Diego, few other homes carry the historical significance of the Whaley House. It was built in 1856 by Thomas Whaley Jr., who had followed the call of the gold rush from New York. The home would become a social center in San Diego, and over the years it would serve as a courthouse, theater, school, and many other businesses. The spot Whaley chose to build his home upon seemed like a choice piece of land, but the history says otherwise. This was hanging ground and one executed criminal by the name of Yankee Jim seems to have stayed right there on that land, even when a house was built on the spot. The Whaley House is considered by some to be the most haunted house in America. There are several spirits that seem to be here, both the human persuasion and animals. The house was thought to be cursed. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of the Whaley House. Yes, indeed, Denise. Here we have the most haunted house in America. I believe we've probably said that, oh, I don't know, a handful of times now. Probably more than a handful, but okay. (laughs) It's not just one of the most haunted. It is the. I've seen a lot of pictures. If you Google ghost pictures and Whaley House, you'll get hundreds of pictures that pop up. I wasn't convinced by very many of them. A lot of them look like some trickery with double exposure. But there were two or three of them that I thought it's a little unusual looking. We have put those up in the show notes today if you want to check those out, see what you think about them. I'm always really skeptical when it comes to pictures. The Whaley House is located in Old Town, San Diego, that today is a historic district with buildings dating from 1820 to 1870. Adjacent to Old Town is Presidio Park. Originally, this area was a military outpost set up by the Spanish and named the San Diego Presidio. For decades, it served as the primary settlement because of the military presence. After most of the major threats were dealt with, the settlers moved to the lower part of the bluff that the Presidio sat upon, and this newer settlement became the center of the government. By the 1820s, the town of San Diego was flourishing. The Mexican government gave San Diego its city charter in 1834. Mexico referred to cities as pueblos, and San Diego only held this status for a few years because the population declined. California became a state in 1850, and San Diego was named the county seat of San Diego County. By the 1860s, people were moving from the area to what is now downtown San Diego because it made shipping easier, and Old Town moved into the background. And I believe that's why the population did decline for a while there. It's just that it was too hard to get to the shipping route. But I think it's really cool that they have this old town that's been preserved much like it was back in that day. That's very cool. The Whaley family were of Scots-Irish origin, and they immigrated to America in 1722, laying down roots in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Alexander Whaley was an American patriot and contemporary of General George Washington. He was one of the participants in the Boston Tea Party, and he later fought in the Revolutionary War. He was a gunsmith by trade and used his skills to provide flintlock muskets to the soldiers. He also gave them use of his Long Island home. The gunsmith business would continue on in the Whaley family. Alexander's grandson, Thomas Whaley Sr., served in the New York militia during the War of 1812. He married Rachel Pye, whose father, William, manufactured locks in Brooklyn. They had 10 children together, and on October 5, 1823, Thomas Whaley Jr. was born in New York City, New York. In 1832, Thomas Whaley Sr. died. In his will, he directed that young Thomas should receive a liberal education at the Washington Institution. On January 1, 1849, Thomas Whaley left New York on a steamer cargo passenger ship called the Sutton, headed for San Francisco, California. Cargo plus 53 passengers sailed for 204 days with a stop in Valparaiso, Chile. I can't imagine being on a ship with a bunch of cargo for 204 days. No, I don't even think I'd like to do a cruise ship that long. No. On July 22, 1849, the Sutton docked in San Francisco. Thomas Whaley's knack for business, partly due to his education at the Washington Institution, proved highly beneficial in San Francisco. He set up a store with another businessman named George Wardell on Montgomery Street. They sold hardware and woodwork from Whaley's family business, Whaley & Pie, that was located in New York. They also offered mining equipment and utensils on consignment to the many men coming to California during the gold rush. Whaley was so successful that he was able to establish his own store on Montgomery Street, build a two-story house near the bay, and he rented out Wardell's building. The name Whaley and Pie makes it sound more like a bakery than a place for like supplies for miners. <laughs> that is true. 
Tragedy struck in May of 1851 when an arson set fire destroyed Whaley's buildings on Montgomery Street. He decided at the time, based on the advice of Louis Franklin, to relocate to Old Town San Diego. Louis Franklin was a merchant who operated stores in San Francisco and Old Town San Diego, so he knew what he was talking about. Once Whaley arrived in San Diego, he set up various businesses with Franklin, Ephraim Morse, Francis Hinton, and even his brother Henry Whaley. With the success of his many businesses, he quickly amassed enough money to return to New York. On May 14, 1853, Whaley married his sweetheart, Anna Eloise Dulaney, the daughter of French-born parents. They set sail for California and arrived on December 7, 1853. Once the couple returned to San Diego, Whaley entered into various business partnerships, most of which lasted less than a year. On December 28, 1854, Anna gave birth to the couple's first child, Francis Hinton. He was named after a business associate of Whaley. In May of 1855, Henry Whaley, Thomas's brother, and his wife Annie came west from New York. After arriving, they lived with Thomas and his family. Thomas and Henry went into business together and opened Whaley & Company, a general store. Starting a business with his brother would prove to be a poor business decision. Henry liked his liquor and was often publicly drunk. Thomas and Henry did not get along and quarreling was a normal way of life. Finally, Thomas had had enough and in November of 1855, Whaley & Company was dissolved. He noticed when he studied their records that Henry often overcharged customers. With Henry also being loud and drunk most of the time, it was a no-brainer for Thomas to sever the business partnership. Henry reacted bitterly and assaulted Thomas in the store. After he was sent out into the street, he shouted insults and obscenities and challenged Thomas to come out and fight. This ended not only their business partnership, but their personal one as well. Yeah, I can imagine if you guys are fist fighting in the middle of the street, <laughs> it's pretty much done. In September 1855, Whaley purchased land that contained the public gallows and cemetery. Countless hangings occurred on the property before the house was built. The public gallows had been the site of the hanging of the infamous Yankee Jim Robinson in September of 1852. He had been convicted of attempted grand larceny. Upon Yankee Jim's conviction, the Los Angeles Star wrote on August 28, 1852, quote, At the recent term of the county court in San Diego, James Robinson, otherwise called Yankee Jim, was tried for burglary and sentenced to be hung. Two accomplices, Gray and Harris, were each sentenced to be imprisoned one year in the state prison. The charge upon which they were tried for was stealing a boat, but they were strongly suspected of horse stealing and even murder. Yankee Jim made powerful resistance to the rest and was finally captured by the aid of the lasso, which in the hands of a person expert in its use is irresistible. His execution is fixed for the 18th of September, and he says that before that time he will make a confession that will tonish the natives, end quote. Yankee Jim was a tall man and he had been hanged off of the back of a wagon. It is said that he kept his feet on the wagon until they finally pulled them off. He then swung like a pendulum until he was strangled to death. It took nearly an hour for him to die. That would be a horrible way to be hung, a whole hour of suffocating. And I love that it was a lasso that was what roped him in. No pun intended. <laughs> I have visions of Wonder Woman. Because it says, which in the hands of a person expert in its use is irresistible. <laughs> it's just because you think Wonder Woman is cute. Well, it's just, you know, when, <laughs> when her lasso goes, it, it grabs hold of somebody. She doesn't miss when she goes to lasso somebody. So I just thought it was funny. That is very funny. Whaley was well aware that the land he was buying had been a place of executions. He had attended the hanging of Yankee Jim. He had noticed that the spot was prime real estate at the time, and when he realized he could buy it on the cheap, his decision was easily made. In May of 1856, Whaley built a single-story granary for 300,000 to 400,000 pounds of grain, with bricks manufactured in his brickyard on Condé Street. On August 18, 1856, Anna gave birth to the couple's second child, Thomas Whaley III, who they also called Junior. Construction began on a two-story house and store addition in September of 1856. The Whaley House was built from brick in the Greek Revival style and cost $10,000 to build. Whaley boasted, My new house, when completed, will be the handsomest, most comfortable, and convenient place in town or within 150 miles of here. Construction finished on August 22, 1857, and the family moved into the second floor of the house, which was meant to be their living area. The lower level was the store. Across the 32-foot-wide front area, there were five pairs of doors which corresponded to five windows upstairs. 
The Whaley's new home was known as the finest in Southern California. It was furnished with mahogany and rosewood furniture. There was wall-to-wall Brussels carpet and damask drapes hung at the windows. Despite being considered small in our era, at the time it was a mansion. The store downstairs was a general store and Thomas solicited cash customers only. The store did not do well because the location proved to be too far from the center of the small community. Whaley rented a frame building on the plaza and relocated the store there. Things were going well, but only a few months after moving into the house, little Thomas contracted scarlet fever. He was only 18 months old, and the disease proved fatal. He died in the home on January 28, 1858. Anna was pregnant at the time with the couple's third child, who was born on June 27, 1858. They named the baby girl Anna Amelia. The joy evaporated when another arson set fire destroyed Whaley's business on the plaza two months later. Despondent from the loss of their son, Thomas Jr., and the loss of the business, the family decided to move to San Francisco. They rented out their home in Old Town. Mail agent Robert E. Doyle and his wife, Sarah Doyle, moved into the Whaley House in 1860. The house was large enough for more than just their family, and three mail carriers joined them, James E. Mason, Samuel A. Ames, and Gabriel Paradis. Unfortunately, the Doyles did not pay rent and they were quickly evicted. And in July of 1860, Augustus S. Ensworth, a lawyer and justice of the peace, moved into the Whaley house. Because the home had sat vacant for a while, it was infested with rats. Ensworth managed the Whaley's business interests during this time. In San Francisco, Thomas gained employment as a U.S. commissary storekeeper under Captain M.D.L. Simpson. While living in San Francisco, Anna gave birth to three more children. George Hayes Ringgold, named for Major Ringgold, was born on November 11, 1860. Violet Eloise was born on October 14, 1862. That's a great birthday, by the way. And Corrine Lillian was born on September 4, 1864. Whaley assisted in the American takeover of Alaska in 1867, and he established stores in Sitka, helped set up an American base, and served as a councilman. Anna and the children remained in San Francisco during this time. On February 19, 1865, Whaley Superior Officer Major Kirkham received a request for Whaley's dismissal. In Washington, there had been a stream of complaints against a Whaley, and it was a detriment to the department. For his part, Whaley claimed his conduct had been honorable, but resigned to avoid dishonorable discharge. A year later, Whaley's side businesses failed, and he took heavy financial losses. He applied for and received another position with the Army's Quartermaster Department in San Francisco as an issuing clerk, but the position was dissolved in September in 1867. Whaley was forced to accept a position he had earlier rejected because it paid less. This position was that of issuing clerk with the Army in the territory of Alaska. So back he went to Alaska, leaving the family one more time. This guy, if he didn't have bad luck, I don't think he'd have any luck at all. A major earthquake in San Francisco in 1868 sent the family back to San Diego. Whaley opened the Whaley and Crosswhite General Store out of the house. The family's lack of funds made them decide to rent out the front upstairs bedroom for $20 in gold coins to the Tanner Troop. This was a theater group ran by T.W. Tanner, who within 17 days of setting up the theater died. They had a small stage and benches that held up to 150 people. One night, a member of the theater group was drunk and accused his girlfriend of being unfaithful. She denied it, but he stabbed her to death at the back door anyway. In January 1869, the Tanner Troop moved on. Guess those are the kind of renters you don't really want to have at your house. Exactly. I can only imagine it's a theater group, so they're probably a little loud, and then somebody ends up dead. The San Diego County Courthouse utilized the former granary and rented three upstairs rooms for record storage. After the establishment of Newtown San Diego by Alonzo Horton in 1868, the town focus changed to present-day downtown San Diego. During a March 1871 raid, courthouse documents were removed from the Whaley House and taken to Horton's Hall on 6th and F in San Diego. After the county's exit, Whaley connected the former granary and courthouse to the residents, changed windows and doors, and altered the front portico. For some reason, Thomas Whaley returned to New York. He claimed he was settling his father's estate, but more than likely he was running away. He left Anna and the kids in San Diego, and when he returned in 1879, they were in dire straits living off of Francis Whaley for support. Who leaves his wife and all those kids just, nap? see you later, and they're having to live off of the oldest child? 
Violet and Anna Amelia Whaley both married on January 5, 1882, in Old San Diego. Anna married her first cousin, John T. Whaley, and Violet wed George T. Bertolacci. The marriage was unhappy, and Violet and George divorced in 1884. This caused her tremendous humiliation. Violet suffered from severe depression after that and attempted suicide. She climbed to the roof of the brick two-story home she shared with her family and jumped. She landed in a nearby well. Hearing her screams as she fell, her father ran outside and was able to save her. Three weeks later, though, on August 18, 1885, Violet succeeded in ending her own life. She shot herself in the heart. What an interesting way to try to kill yourself is just to jump off of a two-story home. I mean, that's unless you go down onto your head first. Yeah, I'm not sure. but You're mostly probably going to break something. What luck that she landed in the well. Yeah, wells were not really big. so I know. So she could have just bounced off it. Then she might have been really hurt. And then to shoot yourself in the heart. Oy. That's the second time because remember in Denver that lady had shot herself in the heart. Indeed. If she did, in fact, shoot herself. But it seems like that might have been a way of saying I have a broken heart. So that's where I'm going to put the bullet. I don't know. Yeah. So this family, again, we have another, it's like one tragedy after another, whether it's the businesses going up in smoke or their children dying. It's not, not very happy things happening here. After the tragic death of Violet, Thomas Whaley built a single story frame home for his family at 933 State Street in downtown San Diego. Attempting to capitalize on the boom in that area, he maintained a real estate office at 5th and G in the First National Bank building with various partners. Thomas became ill in 1888 and retired from the business. He died at the State Street residence on December 14, 1890. The Whaley house remained vacant and fell into desperate disrepair until late 1899 when Francis Whaley returned to the old home and undertook the restoration of the building. After restoring the Whaley House, Francis lived in the residence and made it a tourist attraction where he posted signs outside promoting its history and entertained visitors with his guitar. Other members of the family moved in, and by 1912, siblings Francis, George, and Anna and her daughter Lillian all lived in the old house. Anna died in the house on February 24, 1913, and Francis passed away on November 19, 1914 in the home. Lillian continued to live in the house until 1953 when she moved out to enter a nursing home. The house had once again fallen into disrepair while Lillian had been living there alone. Before Lillian's death, the old Whaley house was placed under court order for immediate liquidation to provide physical care for her. A progressive old town realtor listed the property for sale, recommending it to be used as a motel. Activists rallied to save the Whaley house. On September 14, 1953, Lillian Whaley died, and two and a half years later, the county of San Diego assumed ownership of the Whaley House. The house was a dilapidated mess by this time, and the county undertook an immediate renovation. From 1956 through 2000, the historic Shrine Foundation, under the guidance of June and Jim Reading, took charge of the Whaley House as a historic site. The Whaley House was officially named a historical site on May 25th, 1960, and has been open to the public as a museum since. And I was looking at their page over on Facebook, and it looks like they are still doing renovations. They're renovating a garden area or something at this time, so I think the renovations are ongoing. The hauntings here at the Whaley House are numerous. Famous ghost hunter Hans Holzer has said that the Whaley House was, quote, possibly the most haunted house in America, end quote. The Whaleys themselves told people about their haunting experiences. Thomas was the first to hear the disembodied footsteps coming from the second floor of the house. It was not long before Anna heard them, too, and complained about an oppressive feeling that would envelope her. She felt the home was cursed. And based on their experiences, some might agree. The Whaley's 18-month-old son, Thomas Jr., as we told you earlier, died of scarlet fever in 1858 in the house. His disembodied cries are heard throughout the home. And so what we have here is the first people telling their haunting experiences were the Whaley's. I know. So it goes all the way back to the, the people who built the house hearing the hauntings there. And it gives it a little bit more validity because back then, that's not something that you really would have been making up. It's not like you have a ghost hunter show that you want to get out there. And usually, I would think at this time, you'd really want to be telling people that you had ghosts. And plus, 
not only that is they already had so much other stuff kind of marring their name between suicides and the fight with the brothers and being discharged from the military and all of that too. So you wouldn't want to add ghosts to that. And an interesting thing to note is just like nowadays when kids like to point at the house up the street and say, Ooh, that's the haunted house. And they like to dare each other. You go up to the door, go up to the window. They did the same thing back in that time. So when the Whaley's were living there, there would be these young boys that would challenge each other to go look in the window, go up there and look in the door. And of course, Mrs. Whaley would come out and holler at all of them to get lost. So the haunting rumors were known about the town. No one knows if the Whaley's heard those cries, but they definitely felt the presence of Yankee Jim. The location of his hanging was thought to be either be where the staircase was located or in the space between the parlor and the study. Yankee Jim's spirit is described as a wraith, and he is thought to be quite angry. Wraith is basically the Scottish term for spirit, but they are generally associated with omens. The term also sometimes refers to aquatic spirits. Yankee Jim's heavy booted footfalls have been heard by staff and guests. The Whaley's youngest daughter, Lillian, lived in the house until 1953. She was convinced that Yankee Jim haunted the house. A visitor to the house once commented that, quote, the ghost had driven her family from their visit there more than 60 years earlier. Her mother was unnerved by the phantom walking noise and the strange way the windows unlatched and flew up, end quote. And this was an older woman who had this experience 60 years earlier. So again, this is somebody else that I start to, they're more believable to me when it's somebody who's older and this happened that many years ago and yet she remembered it. Now, although Yankee Jim is described as a wraith, which normally I look to as being more of an evil type spirit, more scary, it doesn't seem that he was that way. So I think when they were calling him a wraith, since they were of Scottish descent, they were just basically saying that he was a spirit rather than what we would think of as a wraith. I almost think of wraiths kind of like Dementors from Harry Potter. It's kind of the the image I get or Banshee, kind of the same things. There is an apparition that seems to be from the time when the home served as a courthouse. It was in October of 1960 that a woman from British Columbia, Canada, named Mrs. Kirby, observed the following. Quote, I saw a small figure of a woman who had a swarthy complexion. She was wearing a long, full skirt reaching to the floor. The skirt appeared to be of calico or gingham small print. She had a kind of cap on her head, dark eyes and hair, and she was wearing gold hoops in her pierced ears. She seemed to stay in this room, lives here, I gather, and I got the impression we are sort of invading her privacy, end quote. This female specter seems to have been caught in a picture as well, appearing as a shadowy female figure. Mr. and Mrs. Whaley haunt the house as well, according to multiple witnesses. Staff members claim that occasionally the doors will all lock simultaneously at the end of a tour day, as if the Whaley family is saying that they are done having guests. Their spirits seem to be residual in nature, carrying on the same duties in the afterlife as those that they did when they were living. Thomas Whaley has been photographed smoking his cigar. He has been seen walking throughout the house. Former museum curator June Reading said that a little girl of about five or six waved to a man she said was standing in the parlor. No one else could see him. He has been seen by adults as well who describe him as wearing a frock coat and pantaloons with his face turned away. He suddenly fades away after being seen. Anna Whaley has been seen rocking a baby in a chair and tucking a child into bed, as well as folding clothes. In 1964, Anna's floating, drifting spirit appeared to television personality Regis Philbin. All of a sudden, I noticed something on the wall, Philbin reported. There was something filmy white. It looked like an apparition of some kind. I got so excited I couldn't restrain myself. I flipped on the flashlight and nothing was there but a portrait of Anna Whaley, the long-dead mistress of the house. The reason Philbin was at the house was because he had just finished an interview with Hans Holzer, who had told him about the Whaley house. Philbin decided to visit the house with a friend. He detailed the experience over 40 years later with psychic Kim Russo on her TV show The Haunting Of in 2013. And I actually remember watching that episode The upstairs rooms have cold spots in the heat of summer and even during the winter when the heat is on in the house. Violet, who committed suicide at the house, is seen upstairs sitting or walking and her spirit seems full of sorrow. Animals aren't left out. A parapsychologist reports that he saw a spotted dog that looked like a fox terrier run down the hall with his ears flapping and go into the dining room. The dog was an apparition. 
The Whaley's owned a terrier named Dolly. Every sense is touched by the supernatural here. There are the scents of cigar smoke, perfume, and baked goods. There's the sound of children laughing. There's the feel of an icy touch. And many apparitions are seen. The only thing missing is a paranormal taste experience. And I'm not licking any ghosts to find out, so. Me either. (laughs) In the mid-1800s, a young girl named Carrie Washburn, who was a friend of the Whaley children, was playing in their backyard. She wasn't looking where she was going and ran into the clothesline. The rope wrapped around her neck and crushed her throat as if she'd been hanged. Her body was brought into the kitchen and laid on the table. Ever since, a young blonde girl has been seen standing in the kitchen and running in the yard or smelling flowers in the garden. There is no record of a young girl being killed at the Whaley House, nor is there a family with the name of Washburn listed as living in San Diego at this time. It is believed that this story was started by an employee who wanted to increase the museum mystique. One does have to wonder, are people actually seeing the little girl, though? And if they are, and if this was something that was just started by an employee, is this a tulpa that people have created because they're expecting to see a young girl there? Very well could be. Kerry wrote on TripAdvisor, quote, My husband and I were the last visitors of the day. The spooks got active. Temperature changes, orbs, and ghost images in my pictures saw later. The weirdest two things that happened was a constant static electricity shock on my finger and watching the curator freak out when she saw the doorknob turn and open by itself. The curator told me the shock I felt was a ghost, end quote. Shanley wrote on TripAdvisor, Enjoyed visiting this famous, most haunted house in America during a nighttime tour. Loved the history and learning all about the family. We just happened to be there on the anniversary of the death date of the youngest child of the family. While standing in front of that child's room, I felt a small hand brush me up from my little finger up past my wrist. It made my hair stand up on ends. It was a cold, spooky experience. I haven't looked closely at our photographs to see if anything was caught on film. You can feel the old atmosphere when you walk into this house. A must-go for all those interested in ghosts. And Denise, I always like to go through TripAdvisor to see if anybody puts their personal haunting experiences. And nine times out of ten, there were people complaining that they didn't have a spooky experience or didn't see a ghost. And you heard me as I was reading through them just laughing about these people are giving this place one star, two stars, three stars because nothing happened. Well, we were only there for a few minutes. It really wasn't worth the money and nothing happened. Okay, I don't know too many people that can walk into any haunted house anywhere unless you've actually paid 20 bucks and there's humans that are dressed up where you're going to have an experience in a short amount of time. And guaranteed. And there is never a guarantee. We've never been on any ghost tour in any haunted location where they've said, you for sure will see a ghost or your money back, something like that. Well, And if they did, I would know right away that they were a hoax. Exactly. I mean, that is really questionable when they tell you, you definitely will have one. Then I would really be like, hmm, I don't know. It cracks me up how people can be. It's just like you were looking at one of the places we want to visit on our Carolina trip, and it's an island that has wild horses on Mm -hmm. it. And the lady was really upset because this is a cruise, but she thought they were going to cruise to the island where she could go see the horses actually get off on the island and walk around or something. And it's like, it's a cruise. What makes you think you're going to get off the boat? Well, the silly thing with that review was that she said, we assumed. Okay, so they made a mistake and then gave the, the tour company a bad review. The Whaley House makes it hard to be a skeptic with the hundreds of photographs that seem to have captured ghostly mist and figures and the hundreds of eyewitness accounts of interaction with things unseen. Have most of the members of the Whaley family that once lived here decided to stay here in the afterlife? Are the spirits of the executed still haunting the land and the home built here? Is the Whaley House haunted? That is for you to decide. Well, this is definitely one I would like to check out. Seems to be something going on there. Our next episode, we're going to Utah. And I don't believe we've ever done a place in Salt Lake City, have we? I don't think so. That's uh, close to my birthplace. We're going to cover the Capitol Theater. This was suggested by our listener, Sue Story. So hope you can join us for that one. We do have some iTunes reviews to share with you. The first one is five stars from Kelsey Hunt. Great chemistry and storytelling. Diane and Denise create a podcast that is not only fun and entertaining, but also incredibly educational. I love being able to spice up otherwise dull conversations with acquaintances with their oddity and this day in history segments. The main discussion is well done. Both women participate equally and even add in some quips that make what could be somewhat dull history into a fun experience. 
They never say for sure if a place is haunted. It is, after all, for you to decide. If you're looking for something light, fun, and that doesn't take itself too seriously, this podcast is for you. If you're going to be overly critical, and let's face it, are someone who listens to Adam Carolla and his band of not-so-nice podcasts, skip this one and be on your merry way. Well, thank you, Kelsey, for that. Also have, and Denise, you're going to hate this name, Seal Clubber Club. Oh, okay. But they did give us five stars. Thanks for the review, but... Oh, your name. Everything is great. I've been listening to this podcast ever since it was mentioned on Bizarre States. Thanks, Jessica. And it has quickly become one of my favorites. Denise and Diane are so fun to listen to, and I love how they take the time to interact with their listeners. Stay rad. Julie from Tennessee, anticipating every show, five stars. I love your podcast and content. I appreciate every minute you guys put into it. I tune in at work, and it makes my day go so much better. I love your camaraderie, and you make me feel like I've known you for a very long time. The Grove Park Inn story brought back some memories for me. Back in 2007, my 92-year-old granddad was staying with us and woke up in the middle of the night with heart problems. We were getting ready to take him to the ER when he said, all I need is some Grove's Chill Tonic. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I had never heard of it, but after that, I did some research on it and was amazed. My guess is he probably grew up on this. Thanks for bringing that memory back for me. I love your podcast. Don't change a thing. Hope I can meet up with you guys sometime soon. And I know we'll be in Tennessee again, so that's a definite possibility. And May then, 21, Spooky Fun, five stars. This podcast is entertaining and spooky without being graphic or frightening. The hosts are funny, playful, and genuine. A little banter, a ghostly tale, and a sprinkling of history make up each episode. I've been listening several months. Each show just gets better and better. This podcast is one of my favorites for long commutes or road trips. Love it. Well, thanks so much to you as well. And thanks to everybody who has given us reviews. We greatly appreciate them. Yes, we do. And we appreciate you guys tuning in for this show. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode was brought to you by our executive producers. Fan of the show? Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast catcher. We would greatly appreciate your review at iTunes as well to help the show grow. Thank you. Societies rise and societies fall. When the time comes... One society steps forward to build a better future. The Wicked Library. Kettle Whistle Radio. Night Story Podcast. Prog Watch. Red Horse Radio. The Lift. History Goes Bump. Listen. The M. Writing Podcast. Society 13. Rebuilding society, one podcast at a time.